Welcome to Doctors at Work. My name is Matt Daniel and this podcast is about doctors' careers. It's part of my mission to help doctors create successful and meaningful careers for themselves. Today's topic is about senior leadership and I'm having a conversation with Fiona Day. Um, she tells me that great senior leadership starts with knowing your own values and strengths and consciously choosing the behaviours that you display. Much of what senior leaders do is highly complex and this potentially can contribute to burnout. So regularly checking in with yourself, checking your own stress levels and proactively managing these is really important. We are all leaders and leadership is also an ongoing journey of learning and she encourages all of us to always have some leadership development in our personal learning plans. Welcome Fiona, tell me a little bit about yourself. Hi Matt, thank you very much for inviting me to be on the podcast. So I qualified as a doctor in 1996. Um, I also had an intercalated degree in psychology and that really kind of influenced the course of my career. So after 20 years or so in um, a range of different um, medical jobs in primary care, secondary care, and then um, moving into public health, I was a public health consultant for 10 years and also a chief officer in local government um, for that time. And I now work as a chartered psychologist in coaching psychology and an EMCC master practitioner, coach and mentor. And I've been working independently in that capacity with senior medical and public health leaders since 2017. And thank you very much for joining me today. And the topic for us today is about how to be a great senior leader. Um, so maybe that's a really big question, but why don't we start there? So what does it take to be a really great senior leader? I think it starts with um, values and knowing kind of your own values and then being able to embody them, to be able to manifest them in, in your work. And um, the thing that I love about leadership is that there's no upper limit. You know, you never get there. You're always, there's always more to do. Um, you know, you you never kind of like tick the box and that job done. And um, and that can be a real tension, obviously, for leaders as well. So being able to manage kind of their, um, their capacity and their workload and to be effective in that regard is really important too. I think, you know, being a leader is also about being always being the leader of leaders and developing other people around you so that, um, you know, the the kind of the rising all boats are lifted kind of metaphor that, you know, you're not trying to do this on your own. Leadership isn't about um, being the kind of the hero. It's about the, um, you know, the, that collaboration, that collegiate way of working that takes people with you and empowers other people to do their own best work. So I think that that's the kind of like the the model of leadership that I feel is, um, you know, one that's particularly helpful for medicine. But I think, you know, it's backed up absolutely by the literature in terms of the kind of leadership that we need in the 21st century um, is you know, like no, no one person can do this on their own. The challenges that we face are so complex in terms of improving health outcomes and reducing health disparities, improving health services that, it, you know, it, it takes a collaborative effort. So that means that um, medical leaders need to be really skilled at leading um, in partnership and partnership working and leading across teams and groups of individuals, but also across different um, sort of directorates, say, within a hospital trust environment or across a system. So working with the wide range of local partners that, uh, that it takes to collectively improve health. So as was drawing on my experience of 10 years of working in local government as a chief officer in public health, working across that interface between adult social care, across place um, and across, yeah, you know, thinking about housing, transport, how all of these different things impact on health and people's ability to access health services. You know, you you can't do that just from within a very kind of internal looking down kind of lens you you know it needs to be that kind of up and out um way of working and that these are skills that people can learn to do yeah i think it's really important to be really clear that leadership is um you know these are behaviors consciously chosen behaviors in service of one's values and the values of the you know the organizational system that you're working on in order to improve health outcomes and health services but because they are behaviors they are 
skills that we can learn. You know, they're things that we can learn how to choose to do more of certain things and, and less of certain things as well. So it's not that, um, you know, the kind of personality based approaches to leadership. That's not where the, you know, the evidence doesn't um, agree that that's, you know, that kind of charismatic front kind of being the hero that that isn't actually borne out by what it takes to be an effective leader what it takes is that you have quite a high degree of self-awareness you know what your strengths are you know the kind of the range of different leadership behaviors because leadership is so such a complex construct there's so many different dimensions to it that um being able to really know and understand your own strengths know your own areas for development know you know where you're best kind of delegating to somebody else or building a team so that collectively you have those um skills between you and uh, yeah in terms of kind of some some general advice or introduction to leadership that's kind of um, where I would position that so that but it's it's behaviors consciously chosen that come from values and that there's no you know no upper limit here in terms of how big you can grow you know we, we've we um human being is one of the wonderful things about us that we can always continue to learn and grow and develop i'm very lucky to have this discussion with you today because i know that you you know not just about medical leadership but you understand psychology and you worked in local government and you work with leaders from other sectors um, and i'm interested in the evidence what does evidence say um, about um, what is high quality leadership yeah, so thank you. Um, great question. Really important, isn't it? That we kind of that we do um, use the evidence around this and, and kind of really use that to inform how we develop medical leaders. My, I work mainly in the context of medical and public health leadership rather than any other context. So, like the depth of my knowledge is very much around that area. But in terms of leadership, um, generally, obviously you may know rather you know it's gone through you know various stages of evidence over the last kind of hundred years from the kind of the Hawthorne studies where to be an effective leader it's about the kind of um you know like the kind of basically telling people what to do and then walking around with a clipboard and and kind of uh, micromanaging people and that kind of being to be effective as a leader in that context was about your ability to micromanage through to stages where we thought that you know charismatic leadership um you know very much in the 80s that was the dominant model in terms of what the evidence was saying but now the evidence is very clear you know at least for the context that we are in at the moment um which for many of us is what's called complexity and um, so if you're in leading in complexity there are certain um ways of leading that are much more helpful than others so this is about how you how you um use transformational engaging style of leadership to bring out the best in other people and that kind of collaborative way of working for some people they are leading in what's a different context so not everybody is leading in complexity and the hallmark of complexity is that kind of dynamic system changing around you all the time and um, it's also the um like there's very few right ways to do things and very few wrong ways to do things and there's a lot of tolerance of uncertainty and ambiguity and being able to um, grow your own mind really the shape of your brain using neuroplasticity to be able to tolerate that uncertainty and ambiguity and to be able to be kind of you know clear and strategic in your thinking mm -hmm. in that context of complexity that is definitely where we need the transformational engaging leaders mm -hmm. or people who are leading in a much more kind of contained environment so this is often where people start there you know if you imagine like a leadership pipeline of how you get, get from, you know, being a um, medical student through to being head of the WHO, then, um, you know, you, you're going to go through lots of different types of leadership and, and management, people management that you need to do as well. So when you're kind of in those earlier stages or where you're kind of very much operationally focused, they, they kind of, they have some elements of complexity in them, but they are much more contained environment, particularly kind of the smaller, the kind of I don't know the unit of um of of responsibility that you have so they kind of you know if you're leading a small team of two people in a very kind of well-defined environment then um you know there's perhaps at that point there are more 
right things to do than wrong things to do. And it's important that actually, you know, every leader does know how to manage people effectively because poor line management has very serious consequences in terms of, um, you know, people, it's the main reason why people leave a job, you know, and it's also, um, you know, such a significant cause of mental distress in the workplace is from managers who have never had the opportunity often to learn how to actively manage people. So in a kind of more contained environment than that, being able to, um, you know, there are specific things in that context of, of difficulty, there are more right things to do than wrong things to do. And, and like we need to learn how to do more of those right things. Um, but when we get into the kind of the more complex, kind of often called wicked problem type environment, um, then when we're in that kind of environment, then, you know, then it's about the behaviors of a transformational engaging leader, which are about your ability to create vision, about your ability to take people with you, about your ability to care for the team, about your ability to take perspective and get inside other people's shoes and see the world how they see it so that you can then collaborate and negotiate effectively with them combined with communication skills. And of course, at the heart of or every clinician or clinician leader these days, it's about knowing how to take care of yourself because actually, you know, this um, we don't want to create leaders who are unable to function because the, of the level of responsibility that they've taken on because, um, you know, the challenges that, that leaders, the medical leaders are facing are, you know, particularly at the moment, extremely significant aren't they and the kind of the level of distress that you know medical directors tell me every day that I work with in terms of how they feel about their um you know the, the performance targets that they're and the metrics and the you know how they feel about the patients in a and e and and the queues and the beds and the the kind of the the system challenges around them and and um, being able to see clearly what you can do and how to be effective and how to not just take it all on yourself and, and how to build that team, I think, is um, is also there's very clear evidence around that. And interestingly, um, I mean, you, you mentioned my um, interest in in the evidence base, which absolutely underp you know, underpins all of my coaching and coaching psychology practice. Um, but I did a, um, it's published in BMJ Leader, a um, before and after study of 80 senior medical and public health leaders um, in the UK between 2018 and 2020 that um, worked with me and found an average of 17.4% improvement in their validated Warwick Edinburgh um, short form well-being scores, particularly in two domains. One was I feel optimistic about the future and the other was I feel able to make my mind up about things. And I think this is really important, Matt, because actually the, the purpose, the, their objectives in terms of what they were working on with me, very few of them were actually around well-being. They were around leadership development. They were around career direction and career choices but actually their well-being levels, when you look at their average scores as well, they were, you know, below the population average in terms of well-being. And I'm um, you know, happy to say that yeah. after an average of, I think it was 8.4 hours of coaching, then, um, you know, then their well-being scores had come up. And I'd love to really do a, a follow-up study. I was thinking that yesterday, actually, I should really get around to do some long-term follow-up around that but um I suppose my point being that you know that paying attention to self-care and well-being is the foundation that the whole of one's clinical and uh, clinical leadership practice is built on and and really about like never taking that for granted because it's so easy I think when there's so many other demands on us um to to take our eye off the ball around that actually I'm interested in maybe just talking a little bit more about that because I think certainly if I think for me personally you know that that's a real big challenge for me also that, that there's so much stuff to do out there and so much stuff is wrong and so much stuff is unfixable and you think I mean where where do you even start and then you <clears throat> you try and run quicker and quicker and quicker 
and the quicker you run the more work appears on your plate and the better you are the more people ask you to do stuff and it's kind of and it's never ending and then you know then then you then then you just find yourself um, exhausted and and i like i like the idea of coaching because you talk about coaching as a development tool um for for that and maybe can you tell me a bit more about how coaching can help that but also what what else can people do to, to make sure they really embed that self-care for career longevity? So I think um, the, f the first thing is about having it on your radar, okay? So recognizing that this is a, an issue, this is an issue for every, well, probably for every worker, isn't it? Not just um, yeah. every medical worker, but it's definitely an, you know, a very serious issue for, uh, you know, for every, clinician every medical student every doctor every medical leader so being aware that this is an issue for you personally as well as for the colleagues in the system around you so being aware it's an issue being able to start to recognize your own um, stress response so that you can start to keep track around your own well-being so one of the um, there's two different ways that I kind of like to start to do this when I'm working with my clients. One is around RAG rating, so red, amber, green. So being able to check in with yourself on a, you know, even if it's just initially a monthly basis and then perhaps becoming a weekly basis, perhaps becoming a, a daily basis, perhaps even becoming, you know, in the moment, being able to kind of where am I right now? So being able to check in, you know, where am I? Because I use a lot of um, evidence-based third wave CBT-based approaches to to well-being. So this kind of like, you know, what's happening in my mind? What's happening in my emotions? What feelings are here? What's happening in my body? What how's that then translating into my behaviors and recognizing, um, you know, your own signs of stress? And so that's the kind of, you know, being able to green, you know, like you've been on holiday for a couple of weeks and you're kind of, you know, you're kind of feeling pretty chilled, red being actually, you know, really starting to be, you know, increasingly concerned about my ability to function and, um, you know, really needing to be taking action to get things back down into amber and green. So kind of tracking using a simple RAG rating score is one thing look a bit more nuanced to kind of score one to 10, you know, 10 being like the worst that you can imagine not being able to work, zero, the kind of, you know, actually being on the beach for yeah. a month kind of, of level, but also that, but that kind of, again, it's about the nuance being able to track so that rather than say red, amber, green, um, you know, you're able to start to notice, ah, so when is it a kind of five moving into a six or oh, now I'm moving into a seven. So what do I need to do? And then it's pairing that with the actual action steps that you need to do to um to both like maintain well-being and stay in the kind of the green or the lower numbers so whatever it is that you need to do for you so obviously that's very personal in terms of you know what kind of what people like to do outside of work in terms of taking care of themselves so everything from you know, food and nutrition and avoiding substances and toxic substances and um, taking, you know, making sure you're getting enough exercise and kind of regeneration recovery time through to, um, you know, actually, what do you need in the workplace to make this work better for you? Because it's not about just doing more yoga, you know, if you're in an environment that's work environment, that's really, um, you know, not working for you, because, I'm an occupational physician as well. So, um, you know, we know there's a lot of evidence that good work is good for us, but also, you know, bad work is bad for us. So it's not just about the, you know, the having the, you know, managing, you know, recognizing your own um, kind of stress levels, taking action in terms of well-being outside of work. But, you know, what are the things that you need to be doing inside of your work environment environment to make that more effective to you and employers do have a legal responsibility in terms of all the health and safety legislation and um you know doing stress risk assessments and and you know what i have found over the years is that people often well a stress risk assessment at work will only be triggered after somebody's already kind of got to the point where they're saying i'm struggling or they've gone off sick or they're you know or there's been some kind of incident that's that's kind of raised alarm bells but actually this is something that we should be you know proactively doing for ourselves as 
um, doctors and as, as medical leaders, but also with our own staff and creating cultures where actually we are um, doing individualized stress risk assessments. There are, you know, evidence-based ways to do that that are outlined in NICE guidelines and also on the health and safety executive website. And being able to um, to do that at scale, you know, as a leader and be able to kind of paint a needs assessment. Basically, it's a public health needs assessment in terms of what is the state of the stress levels in my workforce, my medical workforce, say, and what, what does that tell us in terms of the systems and processes that need to change within the organization? So it's not just kind of all on you around your own well-being, but also, um, you know, these are structural issues that need to be addressed and they're very difficult, okay? When you're in a resource and constrained environment, like we have been for many, many years now, um, you know, if you had... I don't know, the, the Google budget or whatever to like, you know, um, do um, like put on the like wonderful, like everything, like do everything in the nice guidelines around mental health at work. Say, you know, if you had the money to kind of do all the things that we know that we needed to do and to work in that way and to have, you know, um, very, you know, pro well-being work environments at, in every kind of, for every nuance of what that means, then, um, you know, I'm sure everybody would really want to do that, but we, the, the reality is we don't have the resources to do that. So how, what do we prioritize? What are the, the kind of, you know, the high value, the kind of, you know, you get a lot of outcomes for the minimum cost interventions that can help to support your staff um, as well. And you mentioned, we both mentioned coaching as an evidence-based intervention. So coaching, again, you know, this doesn't have to be a, a high cost um, external coach you know the evidence is that you know the more senior you are the more benefit capacity you have to benefit from an external perspective rather than an, an, and that kind of additional um skill um of a, an external coach but for actually for you know for many people there are a lot of internal coaches who are and mentors who are trained properly that can provide low level support um for very low cost um and people like to do that because actually again you know the evidence is that it's good for the mentor or the coach as well as for the person who receives it too so um you know i teach the um an emcc accredited health leader as coach course and on that you know we look at all the evidence around this and and one of the things that the evidence for the health leader using coaching skills themselves or whether they're an appraiser or an educational supervisor or a manager or just a colleague you know like good practice thing to learn how to do is that it you know there's lots of qualitative research in terms of of this um that people rediscover joy at work they love seeing other people growing and developing and flourishing and that that is actually really energizing for the person who is the the coach or the mentor as well so there are lots of low cost kind of internal things around coaching that can be done as well um as well as employee support programs as well but i think going back to that topic of well-being like you know really um having a kind of strategic approach to the well-being of your medical workforce is something for every medical leader to consider as well as for themselves i hope you're enjoying the show please click subscribe so you'll be notified when new episodes become available this podcast is part of my mission to help doctors create successful and meaningful careers you can be part of that mission too by forwarding this show to one person who you think might benefit from listening thank you now on with the show. If, if you talked about this idea that, that we're resource constrained, um, and um, also earlier you talked about the fact that, that you know leadership is never ending, and there's always more more things that need to be done, and it's all very complex. I mean, what what would be your tips for senior leaders when when they are you know trying not just necessarily well being, but but things in general when when there's so many things to do, and um, what would be your tips to help them? navigate that so i'd say like not trying to boil the ocean is the first thing so recognizing that that's kind of 
what we're kind of hardwired to do. I think, you know, we want to, we're like passionate people. We want to make a difference. We want to make a contribution. It, you know, it's the the thing that's like gets people out of bed in the morning and, and kind of, you know, making a difference, improving health. This is, you know, at the heart of why every person has chosen to go through medical school and, and kind of go, you know, go into a, a medical career. So like, but with that does come this kind of that urge to kind of try and fix everything. So like, so first of all, just kind of a bit of self-compassion, I think, recognizing actually there are bigger factors at play here than what many of us have in terms of levers to effect change. But, um, you know, I think don't underestimate your own potential is another one too, but don't try and do it on your own. So, it, you know, like I like to think it kind of, you know, it takes a village to raise a medical leader. So it's, you know, make sure you've got that team around you as well. So you're not kind of just trying to to do it on your own, but then being really clear about, well, what is within the, my kind of, you know, circle of concern um, and what is in my circle of influence and, and then be kind of constantly, um, taking a, a metacognitive, a, you know, getting on the balcony, looking at how all of this is working system perspective and working out what the most effective things that you can do are. So what are your levers? Who are the your key allies? And how do you kind of keep building relationships with them? How do you, um, you know, prioritize different one thing over another? What are the high impact interventions that you as a medical leader can do? So, that means about making some difficult choices around prioritizing, well, you know, this five year period, this one year period, this month, this week, this day, this is what my um, focus and priority is. And, uh, and kind of like being really conscious around that. So not just kind of, you know, leaving it up to grow organically and kind of muddle through which I mean let's be honest most people are muddling through and that's okay but you know even more skillful is to be able to make sure you're you're taking that step back and looking at the bigger picture and then making conscious choices about your, how you're using your time and your effort and also being able to track the impact as well so um so that you can then course correct as needed because that's as much as anybody can realistically do, I think, in, in this environment because it's so dynamic and things are changing so quickly. You talked about the idea that that, um, that leadership is a, it, it's something that you learn. It's a set of behaviours you're constantly choosing um, and learning. So, you know, where, where let's sort of say some, somebody's been appointed as a consultant within the last 12 months and potentially they're thinking, you know, OK, you know, I'm interested in developing myself in medical leadership be, beyond my role as a frontline consultant. How, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, so I think just to take a step back on that question, which is a really great question and I will answer it. Um, I think it's about recognizing that whatever stage of your medical career you are, you are already, you know, a leader and in a leadership role. So whether you're a medical student through to the head of the WHO, you know, you're, you're already in a, a leadership role. So ideally when that, you know, new consultant um, kind of takes post and you know, it's a really big moment, isn't it? In, in um, you know, achieving your CCT for for those doctors who do go down that route is a, a really big moment. But um, hopefully it's not a kind of like, oh, suddenly, oh, surprise, like now I'm, you know, interested in leadership. Hopefully it's something it's like, I like to think of it as like a spiral curriculum. So it starts well, probably starts in school, really, it should, you know, ideally, and then how do we build that into undergraduate education? How do we build that through all the kind of early years of being a junior doctor? Um, and so that by the time that you are a consultant, actually, you already know quite a bit in terms of leadership, in terms of self-awareness, that you've got insight into some different models and different tools and the evidence base so that you can integrate that into your um, professional development plan and your GMC appraisal because I think again you know one of the things that I've noticed over the 500 plus medical leaders that I've worked with over the last 10 years is um that, that kind of we're not very good at doing PDPs and appraisal objective setting in terms of professional development and it can be quite um 
we can end up being again a bit quite organic about it rather than being a bit more conscious and strategic about it so that's another way that you know i think that doctors can be really um even more skilled in terms of consciously using their professional development plan appraisal process to not just identify all the kind of technical things because this is you know as doctors there's always the kind of the technical side of the role whatever it is the clinical side that um we need to be like making sure that we're constantly improving and keeping up to date but for every you know like i would love to see every medical student and every doctor whatever stage of their career not just have the kind of the clinical side of their PDP, but to also to have something, one thing perhaps that's a leadership development objective that they set for the next year, because actually the world, you know, the world needs us to be great medical leaders and to be able to take on increasingly demanding jobs. And we can't just kind of flick a switch and make that happen overnight. It's something we have to, as individuals, you know, um, go through different stages of adult development you know like children go through different stages of develop- development so do adults they go through different stages of development and being conscious about um, that kind of what's called vertical development as a, a leader there are things we can do to accelerate that process there are evidence-based ways to do that um, and um, so being able to link those evidence-based ways into your PDP I think is a really practical kind of thing that everybody can go away and do and not just for themselves but to be kind of creating a culture around them where this is you know a kind of norm in terms of how we do this within our team or our organization or our system and i think it goes a long way that um demonstrated to the people around you that, that you know that you're learning or that I'm learning and, and one of the things at the moment I'm doing a I'm doing a um, senior leadership apprenticeship um, and um, and before that you know I've done other courses and, and other training before um, and it, it's always people are always very interested in so you know you, you, you do all sorts of that, that that's interesting and the course is really good um, and, and and I'm learning a lot from it but it, it that I think the more the more that the more that those of us that are in relatively senior roles, the more that we talk about what I'm doing and how I'm learning, the more that that sends a message out there to everybody else. They'll say, okay, you know, Matt's 51 and like, and he's doing a course. He's like, why is he doing a course at the age of 51? So to, you know, he should be sat in the garden with his feet up. But that kind of sends a message out there that that, that actually no matter where you are, sort of the, the, there's more than, than one can learn. And, and perhaps if I talk a little bit more about how we, how we encourage others and how we develop the people around us because you talked about this idea you know of being a leader of leaders and um, and and supporting the people that are around you could you tell me a little bit more about about what what a good senior leader does to support and develop the people around them so i think this is about um how how the culture that we create which comes from back to our kind of earlier conversation today in terms of embodying your values and kind of really being conscious about every moment of how you're who, how, who you're being as a leader and how how you are fully being that person so for example like you were saying that kind of um embodying being somebody who's open to learning and committed to their own growth and development is really really powerful in terms of setting a culture around you of where it's kind of psychologically safe to be 51 and still learning and growing because actually you know that traditional three-step model of education employment retirement kind of falling off a cliff in in nine years for you Matt you know that's kind of no longer relevant is it you know you you can go on and do your own best work yet you're still um you've still got you know hopefully you've still got many you know years and decades ahead of you to be able to have an impact in the world so um so that goes back to that being able to um build a culture around you of of kind of being committed to people's learning growth and development because again there's very very clear evidence that it it impacts outcomes so leadership training whether it is through coaching whether it's through courses like you're going on at the moment apprenticeships the self-study you know there's lots and lots of different ways that you can do that action learning sets peer coaching groups you know there's there's lots of different evidence-based ways to develop 
medical leaders, but as a medical leader yourself, then, you know, making sure you're familiar with the evidence around what works, yeah. um, Lyons et al., um, systematic review around that in BMJ leader a couple of years ago, maybe it's about three years ago now, is a really great place to start in terms of like what are the effective ingredients for um, medical leadership development. Yeah. And then be thinking about, you know, how are you going to do this at scale across your team or your organization or, or your system? Because, um, you know, you are in a really powerful position to create a culture of I, I like to think of it as like you know continual quality improvement in a way that you know how do you continually bring out the best in your staff and help them to learn and grow and develop so that they can take on increasingly complex problems and really achieve their own potential and you know I've been fascinated by the science of human potential since 1993 when I did my um, my psychology degree and we did the first module in the UK on what's called positive psychology, which is rather than kind of studying pathology, which we did do plenty of that too, but looking at, well, how do you encourage growth and development and flourishing and helping people to really, um, you know, fulfill their potential. And yeah, I'm still absolutely, what was that, 31 years ago, um, <laughs> absolutely passionately committed to that now and, and helping other medical leaders to realize their own potential but also to release the potential of the whole system around them yeah perfect i'll bring us to a close and i wonder if i could ask you to summarize what would be your top tips for doctors at work i have so many top tips uh -huh. it's quite hard to answer but i think in terms of the things that we've talked about today one is about um being a leader of leaders and you know like learning how to be a team coach and to and to coach your staff as well, I think would be um, one takeaway. Knowing how to kind of track your own stress levels using the RAG rating or the um, the kind of one to 10 score, and then being able to take effective action both outside of work and inside of work would be another. And the third would be um, make sure you've got you know, something around leadership development in your PDP, whatever stage of your career you're at, um, you know, be thinking not just about the kind of the clinical side of the role but also you know challenge yourself to make sure there's always something about your own leadership development in your pdp those would be my three key takeaways wonderful thank you very much fiona it's been an absolute pleasure matt thank you so much for having me